Please drop yourself in. Would work prohibited. Not available in the state of shock. Hi everybody, Dan Schinder here on Drum Talk TV at Aquarian with Mr. Roy Burns. How are you, Roy? I'm doing pretty good. Good. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, really thanks. appreciate you My having pleasure. us here. Really excited to talk to you. Great. Roy, for those of you who don't know, not only is uh, one of the founders of Aquarian Drumheads, but uh, was a very established drummer at a, quite a young age, right? Yeah, my early 20s. I yeah. was with <clears throat> Benny Goodman's band, Woody Herman's band. Yeah. I did a lot of television work. Uh huh. I and went to New York when I was uh, 19 with $300 in a drum set. And you did that on the advice of Mr. Louis Delson, Delson, correct? Yeah. He yeah. heard me play at a drum studio and said, kid, you're as good as you're going to get if you stay in Kansas. Go to New York or L.A. and study. Right. So and two years later, I went to New York on a train with 300 bucks in a drum set. Wow. You could tell I wasn't too good at math. I don't know what I was do with 300 <laughs> bucks. That didn't go very far even in those <laughs> yeah, days. Yeah, how long did that last? Well, it encouraged you to weeks. get work right away, right? Well, I, the day I was looking in the newspaper, I was going to apply for a job as a courier, running letters from office to office. Mm -hmm. And I got a call to do a, a dance job at the Sleepy Hollow Country Club, where, where the famous legend took place. Right. And I showed up out there. I had to buy a tuxedo that day, so I got a used tuxedo for $15. Oh, wow. And the, the material was so thick, you could stand it up by itself. You know? <laughs> what year was this, Roy? Oh. Roughly. Late 50s. Late 55. 50s, okay. So uh, I weighed about 119 pounds, so I was just like hanging inside this tuxedo. <laughs> I get it was holding gig. you up, right? Yeah, <laughs> in a way. And the band leader was Jimmy Lytell, the famous clarinet player. He worked mm. with the original Dixieland Jazz Band. Wow. He looked at me and says, how old are you? I said, I'm 19. He says, come on, you're lucky you're 12 years old. I said, no, I'm 19. He says, show me your union card. I don't want to get in any trouble. So then he says... Uh, we played a lot of Dixieland. He says, do you know any of the Dixieland tunes? I said, yeah, I worked in New Orleans for six months before I came to New York. He said, really? He said, you know Panama? I said, yeah, I know Panama. Well, the big thing with Panama is there's an upbeat or right. a pickup. One, two, one, two, three, bump, bump. Well, if you don't play bump, bump, you've ruined the whole tune of Panama. Right. So he said, okay, we'll see if you know Panama. And he counted it up and went, bump, bump. And uh, that did it. He was happy, smiling. And that was it. That's the deal. Then I, he got me a lot of gigs, and that, that was the start of my working in New York. And how did you hook up with, who did you play with first, Benny Goodman or Woody Herman? <clears throat> well, Sonny Igo was a drummer with Woody Herman when I was a high school kid in Emporia, Kansas. Mm -hmm. Woody Herman's band came through there. Oh, wow. So I went back on the intermission and talked to Sonny, and he was kind enough to talk to me his whole intermission. Oh, wow. Hour. So when I got to New York, I called him up to take some lessons, and after a few days, he says, you know, you don't need any more lessons. You just need to go out and play more. And I thought, well, he doesn't want to tell me the secret, you know, I was very disappointed. But he was right, so he recommended me to Woody Herman. I auditioned, and I got the gig. Wow, at like 20? Yeah. Wow. So then I was working with Woody, and we had a week off in New York, and I get a call from Benny Goodman's manager. He says, Benny would like to hear you play, he's heard about you. So I'm with Woody. He says, don't worry about that. Benny will take care of that. Just come up to the Carnegie Hall Studios, and uh, well, Benny will hear you play. So I get there, and it's uh, Mel Powell, the great piano player, the big guy about 6'4". I didn't know who he was. I said, hey, Mel, how are you? And Benny and myself. And he said, let's play Lady Be Good. So I start playing brushes, and we play one tune after another for two hours. Wow. Benny puts the clarinet down, looks at me, and says, be at the Waldorf tonight, wear a dark suit, and walks out. <laughs> wow, that was it, huh? So I go to the Waldorf and I meet the manager and I'm sitting up in the corner. It's like a sunken ballroom, the dance floor down in the center. So they play a dance set, a concert set, a dance set. The manager comes up and says, Benny wants you to play the next concert set. Like, no rehearsal, someone else's drums, yeah. sight reading in front of a live audience. Wow. So Mousy Alexander was the drummer. He'd already given us notice. He was leaving. He said, I'll try and help you as much as I can, but he said, this is a hell of a way to audition. And were you good at sight reading at that time? Well, I must have been. I got the gig. Oh, good. So I played the show, and Mousy said, gee, you played that show exactly like I did, and on my drums with no rehearsal. He said, I hope you get the gig. Well, I did get it. And then Benny uh, wanted me to stay around town, and I said, well, I can't stay around town. I've got a wife and a kid to support. He said, you have a kid? I said, <laughs> yeah, I got married when I was 20. You know? So uh, he put me on a contract. So I got paid whether I worked or not. 
Oh, wow. It was an ideal contract for a young married guy. Yeah, those were the days, right? Yeah, and uh, playing with Benny was great. He was the greatest musician I ever played with. We would play a two and a half hour concert. He would play on every tune, never make a mistake, get the band to sound the way he wanted to, and never raise his voice, and never gave any speeches. So was he a really good leader, a good people manager? Well, I'll tell you what happened. <clears throat> I was on the band about two weeks, and we played the uh, Perry Como show with a quartet. So he says, we need to talk. And I said, okay. He says, now look, in my band, I just want a drummer. I don't need a hero. If the trumpets are rushing, the trombones are slowing down, I don't want you to play louder, because then I've got a problem in another section. All you have to do is play the drum part, and I'll play the clarinet part. He said, that's why Gene Krupa sounds so good in my band. He just played the drum part. Mm. You do that, we'll get along fine. But I don't want you to try to save the band or save the rest. Don't be a hero. That's and great advice for today for any band, That's right? the greatest job description I ever got. That's know? great. And then wow. he was very nice to me. He gave me a lot of freedom within his format. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, so one time we were going through Europe on our way to the Brussels World's Fair where we made some really uh, historic recordings. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> we were playing this sextet number, which had eight guys in it. Don't ask me how that happened. And Zoot Sims, <laughs> the famous saxophone player, says, Roy, you're playing the brushes on this tune. And we can't hear the time down in front. We play their microphone and we can't hear the drums. So play the sticks. Well, I know Benny wants the brushes, so I'll well, play the sticks softly. He won't notice. Well, that was a mistake. <laughs> I'm coming through the hotel lobby on my way out. I changed for my band uniform. I run into Benny and he says, hey, kid, what are you playing on the sex step number? I said, sticks are real soft. He said, why are you doing that? I said, well, I thought it would help hold us together. We're kind of spread apart. I'm up by the trumpets and they're down by the piano. Right. So... Uh, he said, no, you don't have to do that. He said, I like the brushes. I said, okay, you got it. Well, we were going from town to town. The guys were all complaining. I thought, I'll play the sticks really soft. He won't notice. That was my second mistake. I'm coming through the lobby again. He's on his way in. He says, hey, kid, what are you playing on the six set number? I said, sticks were real soft. He says, why are you doing that? I said, well, if you remember the last time we talked, I was playing the brushes. You said play the sticks. Just keep it down. He says, I did? I said, Benny, you know I wouldn't do it if you didn't say so. He says, kid, you're doing a great job. <laughs> Keep up the good work. <laughs> I have a question, Roy. You yeah. know, sometimes it's years after an artist has made their mark before people can really realize the footprint they've left, you know, on the music yeah. industry. Back then when you were playing with Woody Herman and Benny Goodman, did you guys in the band and did people who came to watch understand the weight of what was going on at the time? Was it perceptible at that time? Well, some did, some didn't. But I think what was remarkable <clears throat> was it, I caught the tail end of that era. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was waning. And uh, Benny had made a movie, The Benny Goodman Story, with Steve Allen playing Benny Goodman. Right. Well, that's what rekindled interest in his band. Mm -hmm. So his band was certainly a hot topic again mm -hmm. because of the movie. Yeah. So and that, uh, and I caught the tail end of that. And that was really great. What was unusual about my career is I had a chance to play with all the people I grew up listening to. Yeah. Because I was the young guy that could play the older guy's music. Right, Because right. I, I played in a dance band when I was 14, playing the swing tunes and stuff like that. Yeah. So when I got to uh, New York, I got a few gigs uh, with the older guys. And they said, hey, this young kid, he plays really good. Get him, you know. If somebody else wasn't available. Right. And so I played with all my heroes. You know, what, what attracted you to that music initially? I just grew up listening to it. Yeah. Was it an influence from your parents or other no. other people around you? My dad was a butcher. Yeah. He used to cut meat. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I to always, swing music. <clears throat> well, I used to listen to the uh, uh, was it, like the ROTC at the college. They would do drills, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they'd have a drum section playing while the cadets marched. Right. Well, I could play all the beats on the sidewalk in front of my house, mm -hmm. listening to them from two blocks away. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so I would run away from home and walk along beside the drummers. I was like 10 years old. Oh, wow. <clears throat> or 8 years old. Right. <clears throat> and this one drummer I said, can you play? And I said, sure. So he let me play on his parade drum. He went to visit my mother and said, it's a crime if this kid doesn't get lessons. He's a natural. Oh, wow. So I never knew who he was. Oh. But if it hadn't been for that guy, I would have gotten to take drum lessons. Because my dad had a very dim view of it. He says, drums? What are you going to be a drummer for? I said, well, I'd like to do it. My mother was the one who supported me. You know. That's nice. So That's the best thing that happened once, I was learning uh, 
some Latin rhythms from this teacher in Kansas City. I used to go four and a half hours in each direction on a train to take a drum lesson. Wow, that's dedication, kids. <laughs> well, there was no other way to get out of Kansas. <laughs> yeah. So the teacher was a guy by the name of Jack Miller. He was teaching me rumbas and tangos and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What was sort of generally called Latin American beats. Right. So my dad says, what does he have to go all the way to Kansas City for to take a drum lesson? Four and a half hours on a train. My mother said, well, he's studying Latin. My dad says, what does he need to learn a foreign language for just to play the drums? <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't communicate well, but my mother did. Yeah. Did they ever come see you play? My dad never saw me play, but uh, my mother did. She, she would drive me to the gigs mm -hmm. and listen to music from outside and then drive me home. Right. So you've seen a lot of changes, not just obviously in the retail and wholesale industry, but you see, you've seen a lot of musical changes mm -hmm. being part of it. What do you think of the bands that are around today that are playing swing and big band type music like Royal Crown Review, oh, Cherry Pop and Daddy's, Brian Setzer's orchestra? I think it's great. <clears throat> well, I will say that I was never one to like popular music. Mm -hmm. Even the popular music of my day, for the most part, I wasn't enamored with it. I was always musicians' music. Right. The big bands, the, the, the great instrumentalists, mm -hmm. and a few of the great singers. But uh, I never really got into popular music. So today I'm no more into popular music than I was then. Right. What I will say is there are more good young drummers today than ever before. Yeah, it's amazing how much they're talent just, there is. They've improved so much, their footwork, yeah. the rhythms that they can play. I, I think it uh, shows you how it's developed. Because yeah. I was involved in doing clinics all over the world yeah. for 12 years with Rogers. Right, and I was going to bring that up. That For those of you who don't know, this is the man who pioneered the drum yeah. clinic, right? That's right. How did that come about? Well, What I, were you thinking, <laughs> literally? Well, I uh, got a call. Uh, I wrote an elementary drum book. Okay. And much to my surprise, it took off. The schools all over the country are using it. So I get a call, would I do a drum clinic at uh, Carbondale in uh, Illinois at the college? So I talked to Henry Adams, and I didn't even know what a drum clinic is. He said, well, here's a few clues. I had a terrible presentation, but what saved me was the fact I could play well and the question and answer session. Mm -hmm. so we got to the question and answer session. I've always been a very verbal person, so I was able to handle that. Right. Well, that was the start of it. Well, the teacher, Don Kennedy, later became the uh, musical director for Rogers Drums, oh. the vice president. And he said, we've got to get Roy Burns and have him on staff to represent our product line. Because Roy knows how to play, he knows how to teach, he's got a good musical background, he's got professional experience, he's the ideal clinician. So you endorse the product <clears throat> as a clinician. Right. Basically. But I was hired as a full-time employee. So wow. once I got to Rogers, starting in 1968, <clears throat> I uh, was involved in the development of new instruments, research, R&D, the sales force, uh, the dealers, distributors, going to uh, big... Uh, concerts and stuff throughout the world and uh, mm -hmm. that gave me a, a whole education about the business. Right. So a lot of people just thought I was doing clinics during that time period. I was actively involved in every aspect of Rogers Drums. The R&D <coughs> and everything, really coming up testing product. products. Right. So they told me that uh, the, the engineers said uh, we're going to change the uh, bearings in the Rogers foot pedal, which was a great foot pedal. Mm -hmm. I said, what are you going to do? He said, well, we're going to go from needle bearings to nylon bearings. I said, won't that change the feel? He said, you won't be able to tell the difference. <clears throat> so anyway, you could take the Rogers foot pedal and hold the beater back and let it go. Mm -hmm. and it would go 10 revolutions before it stopped. Really? It was that smooth. It, it was, would just go doing, doing, doing. Yeah, just, it, just by holding it and letting it go. Yeah. So they brought the new one with the nylon bearings into my desk. It's put on the desk. Said, there you are. I pulled the beater back and I let it go and it didn't move. It wouldn't make one revolution. Oh, wow. I said, beautiful. This is great. And we started to get foot pedals back by the truckload full. So I went home one day and I told my wife, I said, you know, I think I'm going to start my own business. She said, you must be crazy. <laughs> I said, I can't be any dumber than the guys at CBS that are ruining Rogers Drums, you know. Not that this is an indictment of the CBS Corporation, but the particular right. branch that we had, it was so badly managed. Mm -hmm. And it got worse as I was there. And I thought, you know, if you don't have a musician in a position of power in the company, the products will suffer. 
Yeah. I'm the guy that protects the products here. I can, right. I, cause I can say, hey, that's not good enough. Right. We have to make it better. I'm not the only one who has input, but I have a lot of input. Mm -hmm. I, not that I run the place totally. I have a partner, Ron Marquez, who does a great job with the manufacturing and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we're, between the two of us, we've covered most of the bases. But you got to have a musician in a position of power. Otherwise, the company will suffer because the sales guys will take over, the manufacturing guys will take over. They mm -hmm. want to make it cheaper. They want to change this. They don't want to do that. And before you know it, you've got a mess on your hands. Yeah. And Rogers Drums was the most innovative drum company in history, period. Wow. What was all, their biggest innovation while they all were? All the hardware. Really? Yeah. And they had like a swivelmatic. You could put the tom tom in any position. Right. First one to put a spur on the bass drum pedal so the bass drum wouldn't slide away. Wow. Put the little screw under the hi hat to tilt the bottom cymbal to get a good. They were the first to do yeah. that. Oh, they did wow. all, all these neat little things. Wow. And all these drum companies today wouldn't know what to make if it hadn't been for Rogers drums. Interesting. And then when I couldn't stand to see them wrecking it. Yeah. So we started acquiring it in 1980. Wow. What is the biggest evolution to happen in your product line? Over the last, in how long has it been now? 34 years. <clears throat> well, this is my partner, Ron. He's really a genius at some things. He developed a way to vacuum the air out between the two plies on a two ply head. Mm. So you don't get any wrinkles or bubbles. Because mm -hmm. making two ply heads consistently is the most difficult task in the manufacturing of right. drum heads. We're the only ones that can do that. Wow. So when you look at our heads, they're perfectly flat. There's mm -hmm. no air bubbles, there's no wrinkles. So you, they're actually pre-tuned. Oh. That is, their, the head is in tune with itself. Self, yeah, so when you put it's on even. the drum and you tighten it down, right. you just go to the pitch you want. Mm -hmm. So 90% of your tuning has already been taken care of. Interesting. Then we developed a, a hoop where the, the hoop can't slip. The head goes into the hoop, and the, beneath the hoop is a T-channel. Mm -hmm. So when the resin goes through the holes in the head, it goes into the T-channel. Mm -hmm. But once that hardens up, it can't move. So the head can't move. Right. So we had the only heads that don't detune. Right, wow. The first time Joe Picaro used the heads on a, a recording session, he said it saved him 45 minutes. Really? You keep retuning and stuff. It stayed in tune. Wow. Jack DeJanet took a set of heads that we made for him, and uh, we'd worked together on that. And the uh, guy says, boy, the heads sound great. They look different, because we made a black coated head for him mm -hmm. that matches the drum set. And the guy says, those heads sound great. When did you put them on, Jack? He says, this morning. The guy couldn't believe it. <laughs> they sound good right away, and they hold their pitch. So those are the biggest, two of the biggest innovations, I think. Where did you start with your product line? When, when you guys started the company, like, how did you know where to, or how did you decide what to start with well, so we, that you'd have something that would really take off? We the decided that we were going to specialize in accessories. Okay. We were not going to make drums, because there are already a lot of drum companies big international drum companies. Right. We thought, well, <clears throat> we can come up with clever little ideas mm -hmm. to make accessories for drummers. That's what we're going to specialize in. <clears throat> That's why the company was originally called Aquarian Accessories. Mm. So uh, our first product was the cymbal spring. Oh. When you put on a stand, you hit the cymbal, the spring allows it to move so you don't crack the cymbal. Yeah. And we still sell them today. It's, it has a life of its own. It just marches right along. Wow. You know? Yeah. And then we kept searching about We made various products that were doing okay, but they weren't enough to support a business. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> friends of mine said, why, why don't you make drum heads? So I brought in a calf drum head and showed it to Ron. I said, why was this so easy to tune? And all the plastic heads on the market is a tuning nightmare. People are always having trouble tuning them or getting them to sound consistent from drum to drum. Like right. one drum goes boing, that's goes splat or bang right. or doing. You yeah. can't get the same character of sound from tom tom to tom tom. Yeah. So he figured out, well, he said, this head is held evenly 360 degrees all the way around. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, you can't put a collar in a calf head. It's because it's skin. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like a Kong, Kong head. They're just flat and you put it on. Well, yeah. we copied that idea or reinvented it so that our collar is round. There's oh. no corner. So when you tighten it down on the drum and hits the bearing edge, mm -hmm. your bearing edge forms the collar into the head just like a calf head. Got so it. it means that every drum head you put on is a custom fit. Yeah. Because your drum forms the collar. Right. And no That's one else has ever done that. Yeah. Was that from the beginning? Right. Wow. So you've been doing that the whole time. Right. And then the, the hoop came later. And 
Then our current product is a, is a two-ply vintage head. Mm. It sounds like a calf drum head. Is that what these are? Right, yeah. Okay. We make them uh, so that it looks like a, a weathered calf head, kind of a yeah. beige look, you know. Yeah. So they're very deep, very resonant, mm -hmm. and we showed them at the NAMM show, and people just couldn't get over it. They've just taken off. Mm -hmm. They have a tremendous sound. Yeah. yeah. I've recently, um, let's see, when did I see Chris Brady when he gave me this head with Jamie? This had to be last August, I think, mm -hmm. and he gave me the triple threat oh, to yeah. try. And I'm so much a creature of habit when it comes to what I use. Um, even though I'm always encouraging drummers to try new things and, you know, stuff like that. Um, and I've been playing 44 years and I mm. was, I admit I was stuck in my ways. I had my sound, sure. but he gave me this to try and I thought, you know what? I haven't tried a new sort of head in 20, 35 years, something mm -hmm. like that. So I took off what I had and I, I put it on and the first thing I noticed is it of course felt different than yeah. what I was used to right. because it's, it's weightier. Mm -hmm. um, my snare drum is brass, it's hammered brass and it had a, a somewhat darker sound to it, which right. I, I liked, I liked a lot. I did notice that it was easy to tune and keep in tune. And um, a few days before I left for this trip, I've been in Los Angeles for two weeks, you know, I knew we were gonna call you and mm -hmm. hopefully get together. And I looked at the head and I thought, I've had this on here since August. And this is uh, May 2nd right now. So towards the end of April, it had been on there for a good nine months, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, it still looked new. And I play a few times a week for right. an hour or two, mm -hmm. you know, in my drum room at home. But I got this 10 or 12 year old boy curiosity. And I picked up my drumsticks and I said, I wanna see if I can break this head. I, I beat this thing so hard standing up right. with two sticks for so long that my arms finally hurt. I'm a little guy, but I can hit pretty hard. Yeah. And all it did was it, it put a slight, like little hairline fracture in the top membrane, mm. but the head was nowhere near close to breaking. Right. And it really blew my mind. It blew my mind how durable that thing is. Well, it, <clears throat> it's three ply. I, I, to my knowledge, that's the first three ply uh, snare drum that's ever been made. I believe so, yeah. But it's, it goes back to the vacuum of the air out between the plies. It's kind of mm. like a 12-string guitar. Yeah. Where the two strings for one note. Yeah. And if they're not tuned perfectly, it'll sound terrible. Right. Well, that's the same thing with the plies on the drum head in that sense. Mm. The plies all have to be exactly the same tension with no air pockets or wrinkles. Right. Otherwise, you're not going to get any resonance. Right. Because one head will kill the other one. Yeah. And one ply will kill the other one. Are all three plies the same thickness and yeah, the same seven material? Mil. Okay. Yeah. Wow. I was just blown away how durable that was. Yeah, and, and yet you can play a soft roll near the edge of the drum. Yeah, absolutely. Very sensitive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I play very dynamic music. When I'm alone in my drum room and I, I put CDs on, um, a lot of the stuff I play are long progressive rock songs mm. that go through a myriad of different dynamics and things. Right. So some of it's very soft <coughs> tapping and some of it's wailing mm -hmm. away all within one piece. And I, I did find it to be extremely versatile, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of our best achievements. And these new uh, vintage heads, uh, the guys hit the tom tom. They can't believe it. We have one called Deep Vintage, oh, which is two ten mil, mm -hmm. which is fairly thick. So guys think, well, this will be dead, and they go, wow, it's resonant. Yeah, I can't believe the sound of it. Well, it goes back to that taking care and the molding process. Yeah, and we're the only ones that can do it that's consistently. You know? Yeah, what's the biggest change you've seen during this? recession, whatever we want to call it, in the retail industry, <coughs> and what do you think is going to change what's going on right now? Well, if I knew that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I can give you some observations. Yeah, please. First of all, the drum shops, when we were talking earlier about the no drum shops in Las Vegas. Yeah. Well, the drum shop only existed in recent years because they did a mail order. Mm. So, like, Frank's Drum Shop in Chicago would mail stuff all over the country. 
Right. So he could exist with just selling drums. Right. And he sold to schools right. at Timpany. And mm -hmm. He was close to Ludwig in Chicago. Yeah. <clears throat> so there were three stores that were very specialized in products. Manny's in New York, his place and Bob Yeager's place in Hollywood. Okay. Pro Drum. Yeah, Pro Drum. And they were the three most professional drum shops, but they all had a mail order business. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't have a mail order business, <clears throat> you, you couldn't sell enough in your local Just area. Just with your local area, right. yeah. Because, you know, like a, some small town, you're not going to be able to support a drum shop. You have to go to Chicago or New York or right. Kansas City some, or L.A., you know. Right. <clears throat> so uh, those drum shops could exist because of that. And then when the Internet started, uh, that is actually a super version of the mail order. Right. You know, it's like the mail order on steroids. Yeah. You know? And uh, so many people got involved in it. And it reaches so many people mm -hmm. for uh, uh, very little money, mm -hmm. actually. You know, once it's getting set up for it's costly. But uh, you can send out a message. It goes all over the world 24 hours a day for a month. And it doesn't cost anything. The postage would kill you if you try to do that. Yeah. Sending out envelopes or catalogs that are heavy and yeah. stuff. So that's changed. Yeah. The other thing is uh, we've seen the advent of the box stores, right? the big stores. Yeah. And so the little guys have had to rethink their business in order to survive. Yeah. The most successful ones have good teaching programs. And, and the great box stores personal don't service. Have, yeah, yeah. They don't, the box stores don't have teaching to right. speak of. But if they've got lessons and the students, you're kind of raising your customers, mm -hmm. growing them as, in a sense, you know. Right. And then I think uh, <clears throat> we're in a worldwide economy. Uh, in terms of manufacturers, their uh, companies, drum companies, cymbal companies, all over the world now. Mm -hmm. uh, when I grew up, you could buy a Zilson cymbal. Yeah. And then there was a Peisty cymbal. Right. And now there's hundreds of cymbals. Yeah. Uh, there used to be. Uh, one drum head company, yeah, and then Re which was Remo with the plastic heads, mm -hmm. and then now there's several yeah. that weren't there before, right? Including us, we're new guys on the block. Yeah, so we've had an explosion in manufacturers, mm -hmm. but not an increase in the size of the industry. Yeah, there are no more drummers than there were five years ago. Mm -hmm or not enough to support the fact that there's so many companies. Yeah, it's mind-boggling how many drum manufacturers there are. It's, it's insane, yeah. Of any size. Right, you know. right. So you have uh, the same size pie or smaller being cut up by a lot more people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's caused people to re-evaluate everything and try to approach their uh, business differently. I'm an old-fashioned guy. See, I remember when the dealers and the manufacturers were like partners. Mm -hmm. and we both had the same end customer and uh, they would cooperate together then the big corporations started moving in CBS was one of the first and they fell apart eventually uh, Mars Music mm -hmm. the guy that owned the uh, what is it the <clears throat> I can't think of the company that he owned but he failed because he thought he was going to come in and teach the music business what it was all about right. they have that arrogant corporate attitude yeah. about well musicians don't know anything we're right. going to show them how to do it. The financial geniuses, yeah. they all fail. Yeah. You know, I mean, you see it happen again and again because they don't realize what a personalized industry it is. Yeah. We're all in this industry because of the love of music. Mm -hmm. Whether you like big bands like I grew up in or rock and roll groups or uh, symphony music, whatever it mm -hmm. is, that's what ties us all together. That's why you and I can talk right. is because of the commonality of music, right. musical experiences. Yeah. That makes us friends who can communicate instantly. Yeah, absolutely. You don't get that in other businesses. But the average guy does a job he hates to do and has to put up the, the, the boss's bad jokes to get a paycheck. <laughs> right. And then he can't wait to retire, and then he gets sick and dies. You know? Yeah. That's a sad commentary. But it, in music, it is. the music industry, there's a payback. Mm -hmm. Being involved in music, being involved with musicians, with people that are famous, or people that you've met or heard about, right. or would have seen, and you get a chance to mingle with them. I remember one time I went to dinner with uh, Ben Strauss from Rogers, Bob Zildjian, Remo Belly in Vegas. And I was the new guy at Rogers doing the clinic, so I didn't say anything at the dinner. <laughs> now I'm one of those guys. Yeah. You know, I'm one of the 
icons in, in a sense of the industry. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I, I've lived long enough. I've seen enough. I've been around. Yeah. So you you get a new status. Yeah. Because of surviving, right. but that love of the music. It, it's like I tell guys, our job is to help a drummer play music, not to sell him a drum head. Mm -hmm. We help him play music. The rest gonna, of it takes care we'll, of itself. We'll do all right. Yeah. And I, that's what the big companies don't get. Yeah. Because they get some high-powered sales manager who's going to use them. Well, we'll force them to buy 12 drum sets, COD, or we won't sell to them. Right. right. Well, the, the, the small dealer got caught in that, at the mercy of these big corporations. Mm -hmm. But we're an old-fashioned company. We want to do business together, yeah. not in spite of or adversarial. Right. And uh, so, like I said, I'm an old-fashioned guy, but I'm learning some new tricks. That's great. Well, I try to stay current, you know, yeah. but uh, it's, it's difficult because I'm not a technical guy anyway, you know. Yeah. In closing, what, what would your strongest advice be for not just young drummers starting out, but drummers of any age and of any level of play or experience? What would your advice be? Other than to go buy an Aquarian head, of course. <laughs> well, okay. Well, you just did it. <laughs> uh, what I adopted was, uh, I had an interesting experience when I was in high school. And I knew I wanted to be a professional drummer. And I wanted to get out of Kansas. Now, this is when maybe uh, two families in town had a TV set. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a very low-tech environment. So right. how do I get out of Kansas? That was my biggest problem. So I thought to myself, you know, the only thing I can do is to get better right where I am. So that when I do get a chance, I'll be able to take advantage of it. Be prepared. Yeah. So with that one decision, I went from a C-plus student to a straight-A student in high school. Wow. And that taught me something. I said, wow, just by changing my attitude, the, the learn more where I am. So I developed the process of learning all the time, mm -hmm. even if it isn't what I want to learn. Right. If I was traveling with a salesman at CBS, I learned all about selling. Mm -hmm. If I was traveling in a meeting with the manufacturing guys, I learned about manufacturing or as much as I could. So just be wide open and learn as much as you can while you're young because in 10 years, it's going to be different. Yeah. I've seen about four or five <clears throat> generations now. And every 10 years, there's a different uh, format, there's different things happening or not happening. Yeah. So learn as much as you can all the time and just become a learning machine. The way I developed some books I had published last year, three books that were close to my heart, I would see these guys like Buddy Rich and Louis Belson play stuff with the left hand and the bass drum, and you've seen those guys play. Mm -hmm. Like, what is that? Yes. It's mysterious. Does anybody know what that is? No, no one knows what it is. Right. Well, I went to Birdland and set off to the side so I could see the hands and the feet. And I disciplined myself to watch one hand or one foot all the way through the tune. And no matter what else I did, I wouldn't take my eyes off of that one limb until I figured out what that one part was doing. Neat. Then the left hand, I'd figure out the left hand. I was able to put all the patterns together. And that's how I developed the ability to play solos and uh, that's great. get around the drum kit because I concentrated on one thing at a time yeah. until I could understand each piece, then I could put it back together. That's and awesome. I had three books come out last year that uh, reflect that. And that uh, was kind of a, a special thing for me because these were techniques I learned myself I was practicing eighth notes, triplets, and sixteenths on a practice bed. My teacher in Kansas City gave me this exercise. Well, I noticed that the sound changed when I went from the eighths to the triplets mm -hmm. and from the triplets to the sixteenths. I said, I'm not changing anything. Why the sound change? I figured, well, I must be doing something. Otherwise, I wouldn't hear this. Right. So I started using my ear, and in six weeks, I could play all three note values with the same sound. That meant I wasn't tightening up. Right. So I could play loud and fast and forever and never tighten up. Yeah. And I'm not very big. And get the same I sound. could play louder and faster than almost anybody else, yeah. except for a few guys. And I did it with less effort. It all went back to that. So I finally got that in some books. That's that, great. That made me feel very satisfied. That's great. What a great work ethic, too. Yeah, well, I find everything interesting, you know. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm never bored. Yeah. Because you know, I, I, just that... People are, are, that are achieving things are interested. I'm not concerned about criticizing people. I'll let the people who don't do any work criticize. The two kinds of people, those who criticize, those who do something. Yeah, yeah, So absolutely. I'm interested in the ones who do things. You know? Yeah. And I'm very positive about it. I like to encourage that. I've had some good students. My most famous drum student is Josh Fries. 
Oh, wow. And I always get a kick out of mentioning that because he's done so well. Yeah. But uh, he, he couldn't read music, and we w went through all these things I'm talking about, and he became a super drummer, you know, mm -hmm. because of his talent. But I like to think I helped a little bit, you know. Right. No, that's cool. Not to go on and on and on, but anyway, it's been yeah. great talking to you. No, that's great. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks. for having us here oh. at Aquarian to talk not only about the industry and the innovations of your products, but also about your musical history and the advice oh, that you've given. That's great. And thank you, everybody, for joining Roy Burns and myself, Dan Schinder, here on DrumTalkTV.com. We'll see you again soon.